Hey, what's up, Summit? If this is your first time with us or first time in a long time, I want you to know how glad we are that you decided to join us today. Hopefully, we'll get the chance to meet you after watching today. We'd love to tell you more about why Summit Church is the place to be. Well, today, I want to start out by talking about goats. And I'm not talking about animals. I'm talking about goats, the greatest of all time. Now, if you're a sports fan, you've heard this before. You've heard this term before because it's often used in sports discussion. And the biggest of these arguments around this term always seems to come up with Jordan or LeBron, who is the greatest NBA basketball player of all time. Now, I need to tell you, I grew up in the 90s and I was born in the mid 80s. So I grew up watching Michael Jordan and all of his greatness. But I have to tell you, and we all have to face the facts, that LeBron is making this a very real discussion, right? How about this? Who's the greatest tennis player of all time? Is it Serena Williams or Roger Federer? What about to the greatest football player of all time? And we all know who that is, right? And even if it's against our religion to say his name in the same breath of greatness, we all have to admit that Tom Brady is the GOAT of the NFL. What about the greatest college football program of all time? Now listen, part of being the house is that we have to say tough things in love to one another. We speak the truth in love. And I know it's a very hard and unpopular opinion in this section of Florida to speak this truth, but the greatest college football program of all time is none other than the Florida State Seminoles, right? Now let's go beyond sports. Is it Martha Stewart or Joanna Gaines? What about in cooking? Is it Bobby Flay or Rachel Ray or Gordon Ramsay or the actual GOAT, Julia Child? How about music? Taylor Swift, do I need to say any more? What about Mother Teresa or Gandhi? How about we zoom out a little bit more? And when you think about every person who has ever walked the face of the earth, whose, whose name is etched in the pantheon of impactful people, what name rises above the rest of the pack in your mind? Can I give you a small hint? It's Jesus. Jesus is literally the greatest of all time since the beginning of time. Let me tell you, there's no one greater before him and there will be no one greater after him. He is truly the undefeated one. I mean, I'm talking about a God who became human to be with us, who hailed out of a manger in Bethlehem by way of heaven. I'm talking about a God whose book has been on the bestseller list since the beginning of time. I'm talking about a God who holds the record for the world's greatest fish fry by feeding 5,000 plus hungry people with two fish and five loaves of bread. I mean, my man can walk on water, he can turn water into wine, and he can bring the dead back to life. He's held as the king of kings, the ruler of the universe, the alpha and omega, beginning and end, the bright and morning star. I mean, prince of peace. Not even the grave could keep him down. Can I tell you, there's no name greater, nor will there ever be a name or person greater than Jesus Christ. I mean, think about this. Did you know that there are 66 books in the entire scripture. And of those 66 books, there are 31,102 verses in the entire Bible, 23,000 plus in the Old Testament and, and, and almost 8,000 plus in the New Testament, written by 40 plus authors from a variety of backgrounds and occupations over the course of 1,500 plus years within 10 different civilizations across three different continents written in three different languages, all for the purpose of telling you and I, the world, about Jesus. I mean, you see, the Bible has one ultimate plan, one ultimate plot, one ultimate champion, and one ultimate king, King Jesus. So today, we begin the second half of our summer series called Origins of Redemption, where we're bringing to fulfillment some of the themes we find in the very beginning of Scripture and seeing how they connect to the whole of the redemption story we find in the Bible. Now, we're now moving from the book of Genesis in the Old Testament to one of the more interesting books in the New Testament called Hebrews. And it's in this book where we see the culmination of what Genesis and the rest of the Old Testament has been pointing to the whole time, Jesus. Let us read Hebrews chapter one, verse one. Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophet. And now in these final days, he has spoken to us through his son. God promised everything to the son as an inheritance. And through the son, he created the universe. The son radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. And he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. 
And when he had cleansed us from our sins, he sat down in a place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. Now, let me provide us a little bit of context to get us thinking in the right direction. We don't know who the author of this book is, and some have speculated who it could be, but no one really knows for sure. And we also don't know who the intended audience was, but we have a pretty good idea that it was likely being written to Jewish Jesus followers living at a time during which being a Jesus follower was incredibly dangerous. And the author has two main goals. The first is to elevate Jesus as superior to anyone or anything else, showing that Jesus is worthy of our trust and devotion. The second goal then plays off the first with a challenge to remain faithful to Jesus, regardless of the trials that may show up. Now, when I read the opening line of Hebrews chapter one, I'm taken back to the garden, the first temple where God gives humanity the choice to listen to him, to trust him, to trust his determination of what is good and what is evil, or to listen to their own hearts and allow the juicy lie of the serpent to determine for them what is good and what is evil. It's like the author is saying, you know what? You didn't listen then and look what happened. Maybe you'll listen now. And there are three major things I believe the author wants us to hear loud and clear. And that's what I want to expound on each of those for you today. Here's the first major thing that I want you to see in the opening lines of Hebrews chapter one, starting in verse one. God has spoken. Look what the author writes. He says, long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now in these final days, he has spoken to us through his son. So God spoke two big eras that we separate into the Old Testament and the New Testament. And in the Old Testament, God often spoke through messengers known as prophets. Now these prophets were to deliver God's spoken word to the people in hopes of getting them to trust and devote their lives to the true God, the God who fashioned humanity, who sought proximity and relationship with his creation. But you see, these prophets only had a small piece of the bigger picture. Like they could point to something not yet revealed, something that was coming that would change the game between God and his creation. But they didn't know that it would be God himself. Like they had no clue that God would leave the comforts of heaven to be here. They had no clue that their writings, their proclamation, their predictions were all pointing to Jesus. Now, It's been said before that if the Old Testament is Jesus Christ concealed, meaning that Jesus is the central figure of the Old Testament, but hidden deep in the meanings of the text, then the New Testament is Jesus Christ revealed. Like if we were to take a a really big 30,000 foot view of how this is true, here's what we would find. That the Old Testament is really about anticipation, right? That, that, they are writing towards something that is coming, but they don't know what it is. Then the Gospels, the first four books of the New Testament is manifestation, meaning now that thing that had been anticipated is now manifesting. We can see it in the form of Jesus. Then the book of Acts, which was written by the Dr. Luke, is proclamation. It's explaining now this kingdom. It's it's claiming that the kingdom is here, that Jesus is here. And then Paul would write these letters to these different churches called epistles. And that is explanation. It's now explaining how we live in this new kingdom. And then revelation is consummation. It's the culmination. It's everything coming to this grand conclusion. But here's the problem. The problem has been that we haven't been listening. God has been speaking and speaking and speaking through many different people in many different ways. And we just haven't been listening. It reminds me of the story of this this man who went to a doctor one time. And and while he was at the doctor, he said to the doctor, hey, you know, I think my wife is losing her hearing. It's getting worse. And the doctor said, well, how bad it is? And he's like, well, I'm not really sure. So the doctor said, here's the thing. You can go home and stand about 20 feet away and say something to her. If she doesn't respond, move about five more feet in and and do it again. Keep doing it until you until she hears you. And then you will be able to tell how terrible her hearing is. So the husband gets home and he walks into the kitchen and he realizes he's about 20 feet away. And so he says to his wife, honey, what's for dinner? Well, she doesn't respond. So he moves about five feet in and he says again, honey, what's for dinner? 
and she doesn't respond. So he moves about another five feet in and he says, honey, what's for dinner? She doesn't respond. Well, now he's literally on her back, breathing down her neck. And he says, honey, what's for dinner? And she says, for the fourth time, it's beef stew. You see, the problem isn't with the wife. It was with the husband. The problem isn't with God. It's with us. We had all we needed in the garden. But when it came time to choose God or choose ourselves, Well, we chose ourselves. And ever since, God has been trying to tell us. Actually, he's been screaming from the rooftops from the moment that that happened, that he was coming back to get what was his, us. This is why Jesus came. God came back to get what was his. And he did so in the person of Jesus, not a prophet, not a cloud in a sanctuary, a human being, in flesh, but not just a human being, God in the flesh, fully God and yet fully man. I mean, how awesome is the kindness and compassion and patience of our God that when we just don't listen, he comes down to us and speaks to us on our own level so we can understand. Like a parent who gets down on one knee to speak to their child face to face, Still fully the parent, but the parent comes down to the child and looks him or her in his eyes and speaks simple words that can be understood. I mean, this is what the Old Testament has been pointing to and the New Testament confirms. Here is the second major thing I want you to see in the opening lines of chapter one is that Jesus isn't merely from God. Jesus is fully God. You see, upon his earthly arrival, God adds humanity without losing divinity. Now, this is important because if Jesus only arrives as God, he could not have died for us. His holiness would have required him to distance himself from us. Now, if he only came as human, his death wouldn't, would have been worthless. His atonement would have only served to pay his debt as a human. But Jesus' arrival as both God and human was the perfect equation to deal with our sin. And the writer of Hebrews points out that Jesus' divinity through four parts in the opening lines of Hebrew chapter one. And we're gonna kind of camp out here just for a little bit because I wanna break this down for you. Here's part one. He, the writer says that Jesus is creator. He writes, and through the son, he created the universe. In the beginning, Right? God created everything and what he made, what he, he determined it was good. But in our pursuit of our own determination, we messed the whole thing up. We ushered in curses upon God's blessing. And those curses don't go away with wishes and hope. Like we can't just add a little bit of Jesus to our life like sprinkles on a cupcake of who we are. We need nothing less than a recreation. We need someone to undo the curse and bring back the blessing because clearly we can't. Insert Jesus, the creator from the beginning, recreating in the now. Let me tell you how incredibly brilliant God is. We all agree that sin leads to death, right? Remember what that guy, Paul, that we've talked about before wrote to Jesus followers living in Rome? For the wages of sin is death. So we're all sinners, right? And in our entire created history, we've proven incapable of saving ourselves, right? How in the world are we going to become alive again? Well, the same way he made us live in the beginning, through the son. God doesn't change. When we sin, God didn't give up and retreat to some far off place in the sky. No, no, no. He worked his plan. And what was his plan? Well, we were his plan. You see, we were created through Jesus. And even though our sin broke the relationship between us and him, he sought us out in his grace. And if you've trusted in Christ for salvation, he recreated you. Paul, our guy, would write in a letter to a church in an ancient town of Corinth. Here's what he wrote. He says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. Then he would go on to write this. He said, for God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. You see, if you are a true follower of Jesus, then you are a living miracle. Now, I can imagine that there are some of you watching this thinking right now that there's no way God can make you new again. 
that you've gone too far, you've done too much, you've made too deep of a mess. Can I tell you, if you are still breathing, it is never too late. And you're not too far gone for the creator to make you new again. Listen, 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 I've been there. I know what it feels like to think that you're beyond redemption. If you think you've sinned too much, take it from me. There's a way back to Jesus. Or if you can't take it from me, take it from Paul, who up until the moment of his conversion was killing Jesus followers, men, women and children. You see, bigger sinners than you have been redeemed by the power of Jesus. Now, here's parts two and three that the writer writes. He says Jesus is radiator and imprint. He writes this, he says, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Oftentimes in the Old Testament, God's glory would be represented as a radiant brilliance. So when Jesus comes to earth, he brought with him the glory of God because he was God. There's a moment in the account of Jesus' life written by Matthew where Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up on this high mountain and there the radiant brilliance of God is shown. Matthew would describe it as Jesus' face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light. You see, Jesus didn't just have a little bit of God in him. He was the fullness of God's glory because he is God. Who Jesus is, God is. Who God is, Jesus is. I love how one translation uses the word imprint. In the original language that this was written in, the word means character. It gives this weight to the idea that Jesus is the exact representation of the being of God. His character is the character of God. Jesus is the very nature of God the image of the invisible God. Like we don't just have information about God in Jesus. We have God in Jesus. When Jesus was born, God came down and he brought with him God's radiance and imprint, which means you and I, we don't have to wonder what God is like. We know what he's like because he has revealed himself in Jesus. Here's part four of this. The writer writes that Jesus is sustainer. He says, and he sustains everything by his mighty power of his command. Now, I remember when I was a kid, my younger sister and I would attend this ministry called Sidewalk Sunday School. And it was an outreach ministry that would come around to our apartment complex and basically like put on this like kids ministry for the neighborhood. And I remember that we would sing this song. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. I'm a terrible singer. But you see, there's nothing out of Jesus' hand. The depth of the earth, the height of the mountains, the valleys of the ocean, the brightness of the stars, the warmth of the sun, every planet, every comet, every galaxy swirl is in his great big giant palms. But it's not just the big things. It says the eye, his eye is on the sparrow. You see, every one of your tears is bottled up as he keeps count of your tossings and turnings. And one day he's going to wipe every single drop from your face and replace it with unspeakable joy. He's so big, he spins the galaxies by his word and so near that he knows the sorrows and joy that you are that you have listening today. You see, the writer writes that Jesus sustains everything by the mighty power of his command, drawing us back to the very moment when God speaks the universe and everything in it into existence. The literal spoken words of Jesus are what sustains all we see and can't see. Now, he's not trying to keep it all together as much as he's carrying it along, taking it to where he wants it to go. It's not like he's scrambling to hold all these broken pieces together. No, no, no. It's easy for him. He doesn't grow weary. He's full of energy. So your need is not a problem for him. It's an opportunity for his grace to shine not only in your life, but through your life. He is sustaining the universe by the word of his power. So when you need him, nothing stands in his way of coming to you. Now, the final thing I want you to see in the opening lines of Hebrews chapter one is this. Jesus is fully human. 
Now, what makes God coming down to be with us in the scene in Bethlehem so amazing isn't that he came down, right? Okay, because God has come down throughout the ages in many ways. I mean, he walked in the garden with Adam and Eve. He talked with Moses on Mount Sinai. He was with the nation of Israel in a cloud and a pillar of fire. His glory came down to the temple. He walked through the fire with Daniel's friends. What actually makes God coming down to be with us so amazing is that in Jesus, God came down in a new way. In Jesus, God came down as humans. The writer of Hebrews points out Jesus' humanity through three different parts in the opening line of chapter one. Part one is that Jesus is inheritor. The writer writes that God promised everything to the son as an inheritance. You see, everything God the Father has, the Son has. And although Jesus is creator, through his finished work, God also appointed him to be the heir of it all. He alone is worthy to inherit the Father's kingdom. So what is Jesus the inheritor of? Well, in the book of Psalms, chapter 2, God says that the Son only ask, and I will give you the nations as your inheritance, the whole earth as your possession. Now, the New Testament says that all things were created for him, Jesus, and to him, Jesus, are all things. So Jesus inherits the world and everything in it. But there's a deeper insight that the author wants us to see. There's a good news for us here. When Jesus became human and therefore an inheritor, he brought with him the possibility of us inheriting something of God as well. The author highlights this in chapter two, quoting from Psalms eight, a psalm about mankind. He writes that you made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, the psalmist says that's who we are if we are followers of Jesus. Wait, 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 wait a minute. That doesn't sound right, right? Does it? I mean, you probably don't feel like you're crowned with glory and honor, do you? Like you don't you don't see everything in subjection under your feet. You can't tame the storms. You can't even tame your own heart. But Jesus can. And Psalms chapter eight is ultimately about you and I because it's ultimately about Jesus, because Jesus inherits all things, including us. And when he inherited us and grants us faith, he places us in himself. And we get what he has, which includes, amazingly, glory and honor and rule over the world. This truth reminds us that every promise that God has made will come to pass in and through and for Jesus Christ. For all the good things Jesus inherited, when he came to earth, he inherited something else, our inheritance from Adam and Eve. Now, when Jesus was conceived of the Holy Spirit, so he wasn't born with the original sin like we are. But by becoming human, Jesus willingly partook of the same things as us. And on the cross, the father gave him the inheritance due to us so that in the resurrection, he could give us the inheritance due to Jesus. You see, he is the heir of all things. And that includes you and me. But to get to us, Jesus had to pay for our sins. And on the cross, he did. Now, the writer writes in part two and three that Jesus is purifier and ruler. He writes this. He says, when he had cleansed us from our sins, he sat down in a place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. Now, Hebrews, this book makes a big deal about Jesus being our high priest. See, sin dirties us in the sight of God. And if we are to be with a holy and pure God, we cannot just waltz into his presence as we are. We must be cleansed. And God appointed way of cleansing us is through the shedding of blood through priestly sacrifices. Here's what I mean. In the Old Testament, a priest would sprinkle blood of a spotless lamb on the altar, symbolizing that the blood must be shed for the forgiveness of sin. But the blood of an imperfect animal could never bring about the kind of cleansing we need. Humanity's sin required humanity's blood. But if we shed our our own blood for all of our own sins, well, how do we live? We can't. Our sin is too great. You know, one sin against God is worthy of an eternity apart from God. So how could we ever pay for all the sins we've ever committed? Well, let me tell you, we can't, but Jesus can Like you can't pay for that gossip. 
but Jesus can. You can't pay for the words spoken in hate, but Jesus can. Some guy can't pay for walking out on your family, but Jesus can. Like they can't pay from what they took from you, but Jesus can. Like she can't pay for all the lust in her heart, but Jesus can. I can't pay for every outburst of anger or judgmental thought or every selfish choice I've ever made, but who can? Jesus can. Jesus being born on that night at Bethlehem was no accident. Jesus became the only person, get this, he became the only person ever born on a mission to die. He became the only priest to ever walk the road of a sacrificial lamb. He lived the perfect life on our behalf, obeying God every step of the way. And when he reached the end, he even obeyed God to the point of death on a cross-shaped tree. He set aside all the rights as God and God made him sin, even though he had never sinned, so that in him, we, you, I, might become what the Bible calls the righteousness of God. Or simply that we might shed the curse of Adam and Eve for the blessing of Jesus. You see, Jesus did not die because he was sinful. Jesus died because we were sinful. He was spotless. We were stained. He was our sacrifice. We are the forgiven. What Adam and Eve started, the cross ended. You see, we've been on this journey from the beginning, looking at these themes in Genesis, trees and blessings and atonement and Sabbath and temple. And while we don't have a perfectly clear picture of who wrote Hebrews or to whom it was written for, we can see pretty clearly that the author meant to demonstrate that Jesus is the fulfillment of all of God's promises to his people. All of these themes have been patterned after Jesus. All of them are meant to point towards Jesus. All of them are to help us recognize Jesus when God the Father revealed him to the world. Now, I can't tell you how excited I am and how forward I'm looking to the coming weeks where we will look at exactly how Jesus is the perfect builder, the perfect rest, the perfect priest and the perfect sacrifice. Everything in the beginning points to him because he is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Can I tell you the gift of Hebrews is reminding us? that in the best of seasons and in the hardest of seasons, that God is still faithful because he has always been faithful because he made a plan to be faithful in the beginning. When he knew that we would reject him, even before we did, knowing everything we would do to him, he still chose to create us and to enact his plan of salvation. And maybe you're watching this today and you would say, I want to know this great Jesus. Well, can I tell you, it's as simple as admitting that you need him, that your life has not been what it needs to be apart from Jesus. Then it's believing that Jesus is the son of God and that he died on the cross for you and rose again. And then it's choosing to say yes to Jesus today. If you made that decision, can I tell you, all of heaven rejoices. And we here at Summit Church want to rejoice and celebrate with you. And so we'd love for you to let us know, fill out a connect form. Let us know that you made that decision so that we can come alongside of you today. Jesus, we're so grateful for who you are. You are the greatest of all time. Lord, would you help us to live in that light each and every day? We pray this in Jesus' name, and the house said. You are the word at the beginning, one with God. You're hidden
for you guys to follow along with us on social media. Whether on Facebook or Instagram, we are always putting out content that is specifically designed to help you deepen your relationship with Jesus. And we would encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you never miss another service or another sermon. But that's all we have for you guys today. We're so looking forward to seeing you next week.